Yeah, the spirit of place. In a funny way, this is how the, the journey began, because there was a sad event that happened in the Pyrenees, um, which was that they shot the last Pyrenean brown bear. <laughs> it's like, yeah, a farmer shot. Her name was Cinnamon. And um, it was such a tragic event. It happened in the beginning of this uh, 2004 or something like that. And I remember the echo of this shot. N there was no, there was only a little, you know, that you'd see yeah, like a tick or someone on a box saying, but what about the spirit of this bear? Six million years living in the Pyrenees. So I had at the time, I was really looking, looking for some answers to this. And of course I, I turned, I was angry with the Pope because, you know, we were in the Pyrenees. I thought the Pope should come, or bishops should, should lay a wreath or something should happen. It was a big thing for me. But I, I pushed back, but there was very little coming, um, there was very little returning. And I remember I was looking for answers and I was in rage rather than grief. And the answer actually arrived, for some of you who know the dream of Balder, which is a big story in the, in, yeah. And the dream of Balder has an, an, a phenomenal instruction from the goddess of death and rebirth, you can call it. She's got two faces. One is a flowering branch. The other one is like dead skin over, stretched over skulls. She's a, both living in, in the dead. She, she resides in both places. So she says an instruction. She says, if you want the light back, if you want life to return, if you want things to grow, you learn to grieve. Gosh, that's just harsh. And, and she said, now also the gods need to learn to grieve. Right? So she gives these commands to even to Odin and Thor and all of them. They need to learn to weep. You know, can you imagine Thor trying to kind of put his, you know, you don't really, um, you don't really think that that's what the gods will do. But they took the instruction to heart and they grieved properly. And their grief became something we call regenerative. That it became not life denying, not nihilistic, not self centered. It became regenerative. So something grew out of it. And, um, and in the world of the gods, this grief was something that even went as far as creating wisdom. But in my own, when I saw that in the Poetic Edda, in my own case, I realized, okay, I need this, to take this at heart, to take this lesson. So instead of having rage, I learned to grieve for the bear. And what I found was that out of that grief, I created a memorial for extinct species worldwide. Well, why not, right? And I thought, I put this memorial up on Mount Cabern, it was in Sussex, and invite three people, I thought. Hundreds of people came. And we wept like three-year-olds. Because this was something that we'd never, we had to, we felt this was necessary. And it was for the river dolphin of the Yangtze. It was for the river otter of Japan. It was for all of the mothers in the animal kingdom that raised their young and taught them to fly and crawl and all of those things. And when, one, when that happened, and when, once this memorial experienced loss, and memory is all we have left, and it feels utterly empty. And, you know, we just have these pictures, we have these, you know. And, but what I thought was rather redeeming and beautiful in the main corpus of the poetic Edda of northern mythology is the image of the well of memory. So the enormity of the past goes into the well of memory. So all the memories and all the things we've lived, the people we've loved, they travel into the well of memory. They become memories. But the well of memory has something in it, and it's called Ur. A-U-R-R. -R. And Ur is a form of clay substance, right? And this substance is a remarkable thing because it feeds the very roots of the tree of life. Just hang on that for a bit. 
So your memories, not only are they nourishing for you personally, potentially, but they're actually actively feeding the tree, one of the main roots of the tree of life. Which means that when you have amnesia, when you have forgetfulness, what happens to the land? It becomes barren. Cultures where ancestors have become ghosts or forgotten about, where the graveyards are not remembered, when things are not celebrated in the past, it becomes barren. And one of the major giantesses in northern myth, her name is Urd, she symbolizes all past. She goes every day and collects the dew on the leaves of Yggdrasil and pours that dew into the well of memory. So the dew is the memory that's left over from the night before. And she collects each and one, all the dew, and pours it in. All the male gods, right? All the solar gods, all the Zen masters, you know, they're, they're all there with the sun shining. And before the present evaporates the past, she collects the water. She's the old crone. And when she pours that water in, that is then the Ur and the well of memory that feeds the tree. And she has a sister called Verdandi. And the sister, her sister, she tends to the present time. So the notion of time is something that I talk a lot in my book, which is not a, um, how should I... It's not our intuitive feeling of time, because we feel as if we are walking forwards. We grow older, we feel like we're wandering off into paradise, or we're moving off into somewhere else. But with the well of memory, we are actually, end, we end up in the past. And therefore, that well, that past, is the very root system of all ceremonial work. Right? All ceremonies bound up to that. So, but, so, the, so the memory, the, the water is there. Imagine it rising from the, from the tree up into the flowering time, and that's the present. And the flowering time is the moment, is the, is the freshness of the present. So the notion of time here is that the, the roots grow out of the past, our memory as water, as sap, rises up again, life-giving sap, into the flowers which bloom in the present. And that's Verdandi who tends those. She's the sister of the present time. And then we have Skuld, the future. She's young and you can never see her face. No one has ever seen Skuld's face. The future it's not something you can look. It's not something you can project out. So what happens with Skuld is that she is hidden, which means that it's the present time and the past that is, that is providing the, the, the waters for the tree to live. But the future is a form of longing. So the petals and us and everything in creation longs for something. There's a longing there. In Swedish, skuld means debt. And in Old Norse, it has all sorts of significance. But the future, it implies that we are indebted. To have a future, we live in spiritual debt. So this again goes back to, to the idea of living, giving something to the, to the landscape means that you are repaying a form of debt in order for the future to be able to potentially to for us to even see that there is a time of the future or when we see our children that there is a place for them to grow up in so that indebtedness is absolutely imprinted in the in the in the northern myth and the worst event in a sense or the event that happened was that the gods in the creation myth they subdued the wild. They subdued the giants, the big giants. And they created the world with the power of the giants' blood and waters and bones. So they are forever indebted 
to the giant powers, <coughs> and the giants know this. So at the end of time, the giants will one day say, okay, we are coming back now to claim what's ours, and that's called Ragnarök, the ending of the world. It's when all debts, we haven't paid them back, the wild comes and takes what's owned to them. Does that make sense? Yeah, so these are the big notions that, um, that I have in this book. And I find that it's mythopoetic, right? It's um, speculative, right? This is, a, this is a way of using myth to try and understand this, all of these ideas. And mythos is very different to, say, our normal way of educating ourselves, which is usually through what's called logos. Logos is the peer-reviewed essay. It's what we've all written for those of you who go to universities. Logos is the, is the, 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 I, the literalism. It's, uh, logos demands proof of the rib of Adam. They want, they, logos would say, or Rick, uh, Richard Dawkins who I, I have nothing against him, by the way, I think he's got brilliant ideas. But Richard Dawkins would say, you know, I demand to see the actual rib of Adam in the desert, right? Now, when that happens, he transgresses into mythos. And those people who are in the mythical inclination, if they're not careful, they might think, oh, okay, we'll go down to Palestine and we start digging for the rib of Adam, right? Now, when the terms and conditions of Logos goes into mythos, mythos can become fundamentalist. It can become literal. And it's a very, very problematic mixing. So, in my book, I make it clear that we should separate the language of mythos and the language of Logos. They are both beautiful. They are both important to calculate the galaxies and the... I don't know, medicine and all of those things, but they should not run the terms and conditions of mythos. So seven days to make the world is a mythic time, but it's 50 billion years in Logos time, and that's okay. We can keep those two separate. I believe that Richard Dawkins and a Baptist preacher could be friends in old Athens, right? Because in old Athens, they distinguish between these two. Um, so I make that point quite early on. So when you read the book, it is not an academic work of, of trying to reenact history or to try and make something which is then orienting towards something that's fixed. It is very ambiguous and fluid and subjective. It's mythopoetic. So the eagle can have a golden beak, a golden key on its beak, but it's not going to fly over Paris, right? I'm not going to say that. It's in the mythic domain. Um, I wanted to just uh, read something about the well of memory. So now you know the well of memory, how it feeds the tree of life. So the well of memory is the source of all ceremonial life. And through ceremony we return to the well and to cyclical time. We remember our great-grandparents. We utter their names. We return to that cyclical time. And the water cycle springs upwards through the trunk of the tree of life, which is called Yggdrasil, like sap, and onwards and outwards to the flowering time which is ever-present. The leaves grow in the present until the water sinks back into the well, carrying all the experiences as it flows into the submerged depths. There it flows down to feed the roots, and the cycle repeats. But the eternal tree is vulnerable to our forgetfulness. That's the thing. Amnesia can dry up the well. And when it dries up the well, and when I talk about Yggdrasil being vulnerable, what do I mean? Our ecosystem. Right? It's, not, it's, not some, it's not some tree in the cosmos. It's the, it's the way the crops grow. It's the way the salmon comes into the rivers. It's the way um, there can be fish in the waters, right? So there's a direct link here between ancestral forgetfulness and ecological disasters. 
And I have a feeling that our ancestors knew this, because you see this a lot in other indigenous cultures. This is not something new. This is happens. Comparative mythology, you see this a lot. So, at the end of life, we travel towards the past, like flowers falling in the autumn light, and our lives become memories, feeding the deep roots of time in the great well. So it's a distinctly different sense of purpose. And it also makes the dead and the living have a connection. As living, we have to feed the well of memory, and then the dead also feeds the tree of life, if they are remembered. And if they're not remembered, they become wraiths, or kind of scary things ghost-like. You know, it's that idea of, of something that's, yeah, wraith-like. Right. Okay. So that's a very um, mythic image that I've given you now. And that's really the central, central part, I would say, one of the central parts of the book. Um, the other thing is that I have also engaged in could be loosely called a fairy tale tradition um, and the fairy tale tradition says this and the great dame of the fairy tale tradition if you don't know this her name is Marie von France I'm sure she's you have a one of her books here she says this she says fairy tales are the anatomy of our psychology that's a big definition of fairy tales. If fairy tales are the anatomy of our psychology, that you get the soul forging of the protagonist, going through betrayal, being thrown into the dungeons, having all sorts of problems, and then you also go through her ascent. She meets the beloved, she gets married, it's always a wedding at the end, right? It's always something fulfilling at the end. And what I have done is that I have taken those rites of passages, say, within the fairy tales, those initiations within the fairy tales, and I've linked them to the runes. <laughs> so you could sing a rune that represent a passage through difficult times, or you can sing a rune that represents the passage through a happy times, and the runes become symbols that can guide us through these rites of passages. So, <clears throat> one of the things that, uh, of course, this, pro this, is a, this provides a very uh, a big discussion on the power of symbols, um, a very, very large discussion on, on, the, on how symbols can become animistic, they can become alive. When they have agency like that, when they can be sung to help us go through something, it's not just then the landscape that's alive, the symbols themselves become alive with something. So the, so the runes can then guide you through various stages of this process. But what I found is an alchemical move that happens is when soul, often represented in myth as the serpent, becomes suddenly moving through all kinds of dark places and then you have representing soul, okay, then you have the eagle representing spirit and this eagle and serpent motif you find all over the world i think nietzsche even was obsessed by it and it is kind of the opposing forces in nature the eagle is constantly chasing the serpent the serpent is always coiling away from the eagle but alchemically great magicians um, they have found that when you merge these two powers when you bring the serpent and the eagle together, that's when the dragon awakes. That's the awakening of the dragon. It is full psychological integration of your hell in your life and all the beauty in your life. And you can merge those two things. Hard gig to do. I'm not saying this is easy. But if you do it, that's when you get scales, 
and wings. Hmm. That's the dragon that is able to fly, to be in the pits. Mm -hmm. But like, uh, you know how Christ would live with the prostitutes and the real troubles of the world, right? But also capable of flying to the highest places. So the dragon wisdom is absolutely part of a deep psychological integration and that integration is is being actually helped the runes can help with this integration i found this when i'm writing the book is that if you study the symbols they can become the medicine of how these two how the serpent and the eagle can have peace or reconciliation in oneself um, another aspect of the serpent will be the shadow but that's now we're entering into a union idea which is deep waters but it is it is a similar aspect to that the old gods also their shadow tends to stick with them they haven't removed it so the dragon wisdom is really the merging of spirit and soul so when I say waking the dragons it's not about dragons showing up and and blasting villages with fire and and binding uh, binding virgins to rocks and having all of that, which is, which probably can happen too, which is also a peculiar thing. Um, you know, what, what's the feminine doing there bound next to a dragon? What's all of that going? What's all of that happening? That's for another talk. Why does the dragon hoard all the gold? You know, all of these things, all these big questions. Well, we know it, it's, not a, it's not difficult to answer because the things we fear the most, right, is also where our gifts will be, right? That's that's a very known idea. But here, the dragon awakes in full um, integration of, of the soul and the spirit. And that's really what I would like. My aim was to write this book for, for that to become a little bit of a, of a drive of why we're engaging with, say, spiritual matters. Why we're doing all this self-help work is to actually try and bring those two think forces together in the best way we can. But again, it's a sacred and difficult work. Right. Okay. Have you written any other books? I have. I have not written books as such, but I do. I do. I have written. Uh, I'm. Um, I started off really as a as an environmentalist, as an ecologist. <coughs> So I'm so I came from that angle. So I've written a, a lot on on environmental matters. I I do write uh, for a great magazine actually. I'm uh, called the Perspective. It's a London-based magazine. I do I do a, a monthly with them, which is about positive restoration stories. We should all read some of those. It's one of those things like oh wow things are going well in the world yeah. Uh, they're quite unusual. But I, I, it's funny when I research these things. It's like. Okay, so what are the positive restoration stories in the environment happening for 2023? And it's like, oh, dear. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's like I have to start crawling in the underworld to find one crumb, you know. But I do, I do sometimes get really interesting stories of positive things that are happening. So I, I do write, yeah, I do write in that regard. Um, I am planning another uh, with the publisher. We, we're thinking of doing something else again. People seem to love sigils. I, I have to say, everyone is obsessed with sigils. So I might be, I am working on sigil magic, which is actually how we can withstand the incredible onslaught of logos. Because yeah. logos are textless mm. sigils. They're not, they're nothing, they are actually. And we are manipulated by them. Mm. So I've worked out something called a demblem, which is to de-emblem the logo. So TikTok, I did a sigil against TikTok because <laughs> uh, my daughter, is, she's obsessed with TikTok and she said to me, yeah, but it's not so great. It's quite addictive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she was in her 16 at the time. Something like that. And I realized that it's quite, it's, it's, it pulls the young into a sinister way. Mm -hmm. So I did a sigil, I did some sigil work to put the sigil sort of as a, as a, as a symbol that goes into the unconscious and stays there and says, this far but no further, to the TikTok enterprise. Mm -hmm. So I'm working a lot, so I'm, it might be that there's a book coming up for that. Would that be some protection against the 
stuff we get from the politicians. Well, I don't know, but, <laughs> well, but, but you know, if you go through an airport, right, there's yeah. 200 logos that you might mm. be exposed to. I mean, the Wright Institute for children, they say that a child, by the time they're four or five, knows about 100 logos. Yeah. Uh, an adult knows 400. But you don't know them in your waking consciousness. You know them subliminally in your unconscious. And that's where they go into your deepest desires. And no wonder they start, we start dressing the same, right? We start driving, we, we, it shapes our society. Just, so old medieval magicians, I'm sure they're all here, um, they, will, they will tell you that you can, you can actually push back against those signs and logos and sigils. Hey. Fantastic piece of work, and I know that so much of your life and teaching went into informing it. Mm. And having been a lucky student of one of your past courses, um, you know, I can, I can say that firsthand. Mm. I would love to know from you who do you hope is going to read it, mm. and, and what is your hope for it out in the world? Mm. Excellent questions. Um, I feel that there is something of there is something of a maturing in me when I, when I wrote the book. So a younger version of me, I don't know how, how I would have written it, but the maturing version is this form of integration with the difficult parts in my life. So anyone that's going through difficulty, I'm hoping that the runes in the book and the runic practices can be an, actually can, can help certain passages. I'm really... I, it's, we're, wishing a lot but I, that's one of the areas which practically I feel it can work um, so you create in a way a song for your troubles again it's like working with a sigil for your troubles and then there was the second question um, uh, what do you hope? yeah so the idea I think is that um, all of us when we go out into our own underworld journeys or difficult journeys in life that we feel that we can come back with some kind of gifts giving, you know? Or like when you read the passage about uh, restoring some part of us or the landscape that needs tending. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be a big thing. You can tend something small and it can have a huge significance. Um, because it's actually quite simple to... The, the restoration story in, in, in the birch tree or in the land itself is, is natural. We want to restore things. We want things to, to build. So I'm hoping that, that, that the book gives that impetus, that it, that it makes us into a bit more tree planters, gardeners, but not just necessarily the physical tree planting, but also um, planting some f gardens inside of ourselves. I, I know it's a slight cliche, but you know what I'm saying. So, uh, I'm curious about your ideas about the stars and the constellations oh, yes. that are meant, that you talk about quite a mm, bit in the book. Yeah. Can, you, can you run through that a little bit? Your, your theories, your ideas? Mm. About yeah, it's such, a, it's such a big topic, the constellations. What I, what I was so surprised is how we have been living under the Greek constellations for so long. Like, where were the constellations in Northern Europe? There must have been, you know, there were hundreds of them. But if my hunch is that it is the Latin language, when it was brought into Europe, 12th centuries, that started this constellation, that we, we started to read the constellations through the Latin root. So I've dug up some constellations in the, in the northern material, but you know, I have to say to you, they're not, um, they're very hard to actually pin down and say, this is what they would have looked like. But there is, what I find fascinating is that there are a lot of deer constellations that you find, and that's great. Um, there is um, four deer constellations, so it's as if the universe was like a forest. That that because they lived in we lived in forests we lived in a forest motif. So I'm wondering sometimes if they saw the reflection of the forest in the skies, and that's something I've started to. Uh, I mean, you could potentially even do an astrology around the constant, but but it would be really uh, it would be for play, you know. It would be for play, but it would be hard to to pin down meaning academically to make them stick because it's so ambiguous, so speculative. But I love to continue that uh, work. Um, absolutely.
Mm. It was one of the hard parts of writing that book. Because you see constellations have different time frames. So if you look at the sky now, it's not the same as it was 2,000 years ago. So mm. math, the maths. <laughs> but what I did find, and this is something that surprised me, is that in the magical talismans, Viking magical talismans, they had certain num numerology in it, like we see in the Hebrew text and like we see with the Greek text. And this is a very controversial uh, in, within runology, but I did find that some amulets had the numbers of the procession of the equinoxes in it. And the procession of the equinoxes are everywhere in magic when it comes to Persia, Greece, Hebrew. And I thought, wow, that's fascinating. And the person that is, he's an, a bit of an ancestor, actually. His name is Sigurd Agrel. And he did all that research for me in the 1930s. The beauty of his work is that he's a bit of a Yeats character. He's a poet and a runologist. I mean, when do you ever get that mix? You won't find that. That maybe in 1930s you found it or 20s, but now renologists tend to be much more scientific minded. So he was a, so he, his work is something to look up. His books I don't think are published anymore, so I, I was quite happy to put some of his thinking uh, in the constellation area, That's, and also in the numerology of the runes. Yeah. The procession of the equinoxes. That's really the part of the mysteries of Mithras, for those of you who, who study study that. Uh, my question was about a uh, ritual, mm. and uh, in the book you talk about how um, when the amount of effort that you put personally into a ritual is commensurate with what then spirit gives back. Mm. Um, and I wonder, do you? Is it the same with negative rituals that we have now in this modern day society? There are some quite negative ritualistic behaviours that people engage in. Mm. Would you say that kind of spiritually that also has the same kind of, you know, but, but in a slightly negative way? Negative ritual? Oh, wow, that, that's an interesting. Um, well, TikTok. Oh, yeah, I see. Okay, I get it. I get it. Ritualised behaviours. I get it. I understand now. Yeah. The 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 way I could say this. Uh, I went to visit the San people, and they live uh, in the deserts of Namibia, uh, still very tribal lifestyles. Uh, sadly, they're, they're losing it, but um, as all, all over the world. But when, when I came there, I brought my Viking beads with me, <laughs> <laughs> worth hundreds of pounds, like fantastic beads. And I said, look, you know, let's trade, like, because they know be ev Ancient cultures love beads. <laughs> like if you meet uh, all over the world, you can go to the South Pacific. If you've got some beads, that you can trade. It's like an old memory. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, you know, here are my Viking beads. There were quartz beads. There were like crystal beads, you know. And they had these little uh, ostrich shells that they they whack with flint and they pierce them. And the women and the men they 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 work through this, and it's a real labor. So they looked at my beads, my glass beads, and my crystal beads, and they immediately said, no, no, this is not worth anything. I was like, hey, what's going on? It's like, because a machine has pierced the bead. Ah. So your, your spiritual currency are not in this bead. <laughs> this is not going to work for libations, I'm sorry, right? Whereas the currency of their ostrich shell, someone would have worked maybe a week to by flint to shape it and pierce it and when that happened imagine giving that in ritual so the currency immediately became that the effort you put in like you said and the craft you bring in your in your gift giving doesn't have to be material it can also be words it can sometimes be harder to praise someone like you, someone you a family member to tell them that you love them can be one of the hardest things but so you have then the this idea that it's in us that we know what our spiritual debt really is we know it we can usually feel it and when something is purchased and a machine has drilled everything in those beads i don't know if the gods would be uh you know it's like okay you know i'd rather have a glass of wine that you have made or you know um so yeah so everything is really to do 
a lot of it is to do with how much of that effort you put in and especially if you can sing over it whilst you do it and if you remember a story whilst you do it so a lot of the times um, one of the things I teach is if, if you know the creation myth you know that you need fire you need water you need clay for anything to be created something has to be offered if you go home tonight and cook try and imagine something that's not offered <laughs> everything is a sacrifice and that is the trouble of creation and I think that is one of the lessons that if you are going to offer something like the poor chicken in the oven uh, or the vegetable that you have to cut and all of these things that you put then a, 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 a an attitude towards it that you have that you are accruing this debt and you have to repay it somehow and that would be then in Fantastic. in some act or something <laughs> yeah that's perfect yeah. thank you thank you thank so you. much